I have to say I'm slightly nervous standing before you because at least two speak speakers have talked about the tradition of taking people called Charles from this room and taking them outside <laughs> and executing them. It sort of brings a new meaning to dying on stage. So as John said, I'm a population biologist. I'm interested in issues of resource scarcity, food scarcity. I'm interested in biodiversity, water, and things. And so you would expect from me some doom and gloom, and you're going to get a little bit of doom and gloom. But, and I have to be careful because I bre might break my contract as an academic population biologist, I'm also an optimist. And what I hope to tell you about in the next 10 minutes or so is both why I'm an optimist and why, age 53, I'm more of an optimist than, I, than when I was half my age. And I would say I'm a guarded optimist. I'd completely lose my license to talk about these things if I said I was an unconditional optimist. But I am an optimist, nevertheless. So let me begin by just saying a little bit about the two founding figures of my field of population biology. I suspect most people will recognize Charles Darwin on the left, the peerless Charles Darwin, one of the most important scientists ever to have lived who came up with the theory of natural selection. Many of you will also know the person on the right, Thomas Malthus. Thomas Malthus was the person who really first understood the enormous power of population growth. Population growth is different from many other processes. Populations grow geometrically, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32. They have this enormous power of increase. And Malthus' insight in an essay, an essay on the principle of population, 17. 98 had enormous influence on many people. It had an enormous influence on Charles Darwin. Charles Darwin realized that with this enormous potential for population growth, a huge number of individuals must die. We're talking about animals here, not animals and plants, not humans. And hence, he was able to perceive how powerful the effect of natural selection might be. Malthus himself. Uh, made many deductions from the, his uh, insight into the power of population growth. Malthus was an upper-class English vicar. And when he thought about the power of population growth, he immediately got worried about the feckless lower classes, which, according to Malthus, were going to be the ruin of the British Isles. Then he was worried about women. I can't quite understand why he's worried about women. Then he was worried about the Irish. And, then, and he was writing only 10 years after the French Revolution, he was particularly worried about the French. So Malthus was essentially worried about virtually everyone who wasn't an upper-class male, probably vicar, like him. <laughs> Darwin would be a wonderful person to spend an evening with at the pub. I suspect Malthus wouldn't be. But Malthus influenced many population dynamics, including me when I was a student. We were all aware of the enormous growth of populations over historical time the hockey stick shaped curve of human populations. I've blown it up a bit there for, uh, for more recent times. Certainly when I was a student in the uh, 70s and 80s, it did look like population was just uh, still growing very fast. Um, there were a number of very influential authors at that time pointing out some of the issues. Paul Ehrlich, an entomologist like me, published in 1968 a hugely influential book called The Population Bomb saying, um, saying uh, some of the challenges that the world faced because of population growth. So why, am I more of an why I am more of an optimist now than I was 25 years ago is for a number of reasons, but for two facts that I want to tell you about today. And the first fact is that there is some really good news about, um, about populations. I'm going to call this the two most momentous events in my adult intellectual life. And the momentous event is that the rate of growth of population is slowing down at the moment. Do you see that in the last 20 years, it's, it's not this sort of hockey stick approach. The rate of growth is going down. And if we extrapolate into the future, the best guesses we have, uh, the figures here come from the United Nations Population Division, and there are other groups who've come to similar conclusions. The best guess we have at the moment is populations will plateau somewhere around 10 billion people by the end of the century. Now, to me, that is the most extraordinary intellectual finding that we've had over the last 10 years. And it makes me 
optimistic that it is possible intellectually to conceive of a time when humanity's footprint on the Earth may cease to increase. And what's even better is that we have an increasingly good idea of why this is happening. Demographers understand that human populations naturally reduce their fecundity, naturally reduce the number of children they have if they become richer, but in particular if they have access to education, in particular of girls, and if they have access to good health care and access to family planning. So we know what needs to be done. Now, I did say I was a guarded optimism, and I want to show you the same figure that I showed you before of the extrapolations into the future, but put in the uncertainty. And when one puts in the uncertainty, it is pretty frightening. The red line is what might happen if things, everything went wrong. The green line is what might happen if everything goes right. Somewhere we think reality will be in the middle. What it says to me is that the, it's game on. We really have to do a lot to look at population growth rates. And this is a hard, difficult issue, especially for politicians to get involved with. To be bluntly, there are some nutters out there who are obsessed by coercive means of population reduction and things. And this has put off a lot of people from talking about the importance of curbing population growth. So I think some bravery is needed to get out and do that. And I think when one is talking about trying to reduce population growth, many of the issues of which are in least developed countries, one of the ways of doing it in a responsible way is to say it's not just population growth, it's also consumption. And whereas many of the issues of fast population growth are in least developed countries, the majority of issues of overconsumption are in the rich world. If you compare our, compa our per capita consumption of food, of water, of energy in the West, in the rich world, it's 10 to 20 times that of people who live in the, world, in the poor world. Consumption has become an integral part of our culture. It's no coincidence that some of the most iconic images of art over the last half century involve swimming pools, hamburgers, and gas, and gas stations. So it's not just numbers, it's the amount of food we consume as individuals. And the sad truth is that even if the population did plateau at about 10 billion people, we would be in real trouble if all those 10 billion people aspired to consume at the level that we enjoy in the rich West. And let me give you one example of this, and this is meat consumption. Now, Meat consumption as an element of our diet matters because to produce a kilogram of meat requires, it, it depends on the particular type of meat, but typically about 10 times more resources than to produce a kilogram of plant-based food. So the more we eat meat, the more pressures that we put on the environment. And that's meat consumption in the rich world. This is uh, FAO, Food and Agriculture Organization, figures over the last 40 years or so, it's sort of going up a little bit in developed nations. Actually, in Europe, it's coming down slightly. I remember I gave this lecture once to some students at Oxford, and I joked that if you're an American, it's physically impossible for you to eat more meat than you do at the moment. And I got that sent to me by email the, the next morning. <laughs> so it probably is possible to eat a bit more. But these are some other regions. So if you look at China, China is a country which um, I'm old enough to remember. When I was a kid and I didn't eat my, my spinach or something like that, my mother would say, think of the starving in China. And we don't do that. I mean, China is a huge success story in how it manages to feed a very large population. But look at how its meat consumption is going up. Interestingly, India, a country that is going through a fairly similar economic trajectory, its diet change has been far slower for complex social, political, and, and e economic reasons, re, uh, reasons. So there's some real issues here, here. And I think within the context of democracy that we're talking about today, a, a real challenge facing the globe over the next 20 or 30 years is how we can change our diets within a democratic system. 
And I'm talking about it within the context of the environment and the context of resources. But one could have someone up here saying virtually the same arguments within the context of obesity and the context of health. So the second most momentous event in my adult intellectual life is that it is no longer possible to smoke in public in France. Now, I don't want to completely follow into the Malthusian anti-French uh, rhetoric here, but certainly when I was a teenager and used to go on holiday in France and looking at the French love affair with Galois and other Disbleur and other things, it would seem to me completely incomprehensible that any government in France could ever pass legislation saying that you couldn't smoke in a restaurant, even though we've known, as a matter of fact, that smoking kills us for over 60 years. And I think the most momentous thing that has happened over that period is that civil society has got together and it has legitimized its government to make some of these really hard decisions, such as affecting within boundaries our freedoms of individuals to do things. So I do wonder whether Magritte, who I know is Belgium, not French, might have had some inkling in advance about what was going to happen in France. So I did promise a little bit of doom and gloom, and there is going to be a bit of doom and gloom in this, in this slide. I think that when you consider the, foods, the food system, how we produce food throughout the world, that uh, we are almost sleepwalking to disaster at the moment. If you look at the challenges on all sides of the food system, there is some real concerns ahead. I've talked about demand. Population is going up and, and demand is going up. Even if it will plateau, it is going to go up a lot. We have to look at the supply side as well. The old joke of land, they're not making it anymore, is true, unless perhaps you're Dutch. We're going to see competition for the land that's left. We're going to see increasing competition for water. Water is really scary. We're going to see water running out, especially underground water, which will literally run out, not water that's, that's raining down. And we're going to see increasing competition for energy. The way we produce food at the moment is literally unsustainable. If we continue doing what we're doing to soils, our water resources, and the way we produce food at the moment, we will not have the capability to produce food in the same way in 20 or 30 years' time. And finally, the progress that has been made over the last 20, 20 years or so in reducing the number of people who go to bed hungry on Earth has begun to reverse. So we have all sorts of problems there. And a slogan, business as usual, won't work. I, I, ra I very much regret putting that cliche, business as usual, after Richard Hennessy's wonderful uh, talk this, this, uh, earlier on. There is a real risk of major socioeconomic and environmental disruption. And I wonder whether we're even beginning to see this at the moment. This is the index of food prices uh, from the FAO, which has remained relatively constant since the 1970s. And as all of you will know from what's been in the papers, we begin to see both food price volatility, but in a sense, what worries me is not so much the volatility, but, which that, but what looks like a secular increase, a, a general trend at the end for increasing food price. And I would argue that this is the beginning of these ineluctable economic laws of supply and demand beginning to affect prices. And it would be foolish to say that um, the Arab Spring uh, was purely due to food prices and some of the other disrupt political disruptions we've seen recently, but I suspect it has been part of it. So my final slide, or penultimate slide, what do we need to do? Well, the argument I would make is that the challenges facing the global food system are so great we need actions at all levels. We need to produce more food, but we need to produce it in new ways. We need to produce more food sustainably. We need to reduce food waste, and we now live inescapably in a globalized food system. And in fact, we need that globalization so that we can allow one area to compensate for problems elsewhere. We need, as Joe Stieglitz says, to make globalization work in favor of food security and societal needs. As I say, we need to curb population growth, and we need to moderate demand. 
And this moderation of demand, it requires action by governments, it requires actions by us as individuals, and other actors as well. I could have put the private sector up there as well. But I think within the context of the theme of today's meeting is how do we legitimize governments to act in our, in our name, in a democracy? How much power do we give our governments to make the type of decisions in the food system that they've made in the, uh, in, for, for tobacco? I don't know the answer for this, but if we don't get this right, then I really do worry where we're headed. So that was my question right at the beginning, and I think the answer really is we, we can blame politicians, and many politicians do deserve some blames, but it's also up to us. Thank you very much. Thank you.